The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, after four long months, art galleries are open again in England. We visit some of the shows and talk to the artist Idris Khan. And as we look at art in the flesh again, this episode's work of the week is with an artist whose latest project stems from direct encounters with ancient Greek objects, the photographer James Welling. Before that, the third series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, in which I talk to artists about their life and work through their influences and cultural experiences, is now complete. The latest episode is with the Korean artist Doho Sa, and you can listen to that, the rest of the series with Julie Meritu, Ali Banisad and Doris Salcedo, and indeed the full archive of interviews, wherever you're listening now. Now, England took a major step in its roadmap for the lifting of lockdown restrictions this week. Pubs and restaurants were allowed to open outdoors, hairdressers, swimming pools and gyms welcomed back customers, and non-essential retail opened too. And this means that commercial galleries could open their doors. I met with Louisa Buck, the art newspaper's contemporary art correspondent, to talk about the reopening and some of the shows we've seen, and to take a tour of Rachel Whiteread's exhibition at the Gagosian Gallery in Grosvenor Hill in London's Mayfair district. Louisa, this is the second time we've had a sort of major release from lockdown. How do you feel this time? Majorly released, it has to be said. I think this time, because the last lockdown was so grim, so dark, so awful, with no sort of time frame attached, um, I think this time it's, it's a great feeling of release, a great feeling of excitement to be seeing art again. We've been gazing at those wretched screens for too damn long. It's so lovely to get up close and physical with artworks again. Yeah, I don't know about you, but the last time, in last June, when the galleries opened, I remember being sort of excited to see the art, but also incredibly fearful. that We didn't know so much, perhaps, about the virus at that stage. The vaccine programmes hadn't started. I was almost overcome with fear before, and I don't feel that this time. I feel like, you know, I really am genuinely sort of relishing this opportunity, finally, to get back and, and looking at art. What, what about you? I think that loathsome expression, new normal, but I think we have learnt to kind of manage it manage our anxiety each of us had different responses different thresholds but somehow everybody seems less paranoid you know in the galleries they're a little bit more relaxed about you coming and they're still observing all the social distancing but there's not that sort of tight-lipped white knuckle feel you know people are really excited to be showing their art again and for you to be coming in and appreciating it and I think there is a general kind of exhale going on and a love of looking yeah, that, that's a really good way of putting it. That it is an exhale. It's a, it's a sort of sense of everybody just coming together for a, for a positive moment. And you know, you've had conversations with dealers to that effect, haven't you? I mean, I was in Sadie Cole's, who sneakily opened another West End gallery in Berry Street, by the way, with this opening. Um, but in her two main galleries, she has the Swiss artist Udo Rodinoni, beautiful cast glass horses and ex- great big exuberant boulder-shaped canvases on the walls. And she's so excited to be showing people work. I mean, let's not forget, art dealers get demonised, but you know, the really good ones want people to see their art. They don't want to just sell it, they want to show it. They want to support their artists. And Udo Rodinoni made this extraordinary, joyful, exuberant, vivid show during lockdown. So it's also a release for him to be showing the work and for her to be showing it off. So I think, you know, gallerists are very excited about it. Um, also, at the Listen Gallery, they were delighted as well to see us. You know, I think there is a sort of feeling, you know, of the, the fact that we're out there, we're looking at it, they can share what, after all, is their main concern, the art and the artists. That's right. So let's talk about some art and artists then, because it, we, we both of us have seen quite a few shows now. I wonder if we, sh- we should start with that Listen Gallery show, actually. Well, I mean, the John O'Confra, my goodness, what an amazing show that was. I mean, it's, it's called The Unintended Beauty of Disaster. I mean, what a great title. <laughs> and it was a great opportunity to see, I, I'm sure you probably agree, the fantastic Four Nocturnes, that epic three-screen piece that we saw debuted at the Ghanaian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, but there there were seething masses of people. Now you can immerse yourself... Again, Again, another wonderful plus for seeing art physically, even if it's screen-based. You know, you can see it properly. You can revel in it. This great epic elegy to climate disaster, migration, 
elephants mourning their young, colonialist trophies, great expanses of African scenery. I mean, what a great piece. It's actually, I hadn't seen it in Venice, and so it was, you know, I was really welcome this opportunity to see that work. And there's lovely, rippling languages from that work through that sequence of works, which began with um, Vertigo C in 2015 and then continued with Purple, which was a six-screen thing at the, at the Barbican in 2017. I love the, the sort of way that there are sort of motifs that run through that series. There's this... Um, these archival photographs of colonial period uh, archival shots, which which ripple beneath water, you know, and these, then the, these... and the water, of course, as well. That constant feeling of diaspora, of slavery, of movements of time. And but you know, he does epic in a way that isn't shallow and facile. He really is an extraordinary. He talks about choreographing his work, and they really are choreographed. And it was such a treat. And also, of course, to see his new work that we made made during lockdown, Triptych, which is just an extraordinary foray into portraiture. Again, three screens filmed in Bahia Salvador of just the multiplicity of wonderful faces focused around the Black Lives Matter protests but celebrating diversity but also with a searing undertow as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and that piece is wonderful because it follows the structure of this jazz classic, a kind of civil rights era jazz classic, which is a sort of in three parts. And in the middle of that, you have this extraordinary sequence where the, the, the singer, Abby Lincoln, just basically screams for a period of a couple of minutes. And it's accompanied by these sort of slowed down dancing figures on the screen. And it's, this, it's a moment of, on the screen, a kind of celebration. But in, 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 the, in the music, this kind of lacerating scream, you know, in a quite extraordinary moment. Absolutely, and then it ends with Breonna Taylor, the portraits, the murals, the public artworks of her, so it ends with this elegiac, quiet note again. So again, this choreography of his work, and you just don't get it on a computer screen. You have to be there, letting it all wash over you, and it was just such a treat. And now alongside that, another on the, the other Listen Gallery down the road is, is Infinity of Traces, a show curated by Echo Eschen, and that's a wonderful show too. Absolutely. It? Eleven women and non-binary artists. It's a show that celebrates, that explores, that challenges the black experience, but not in a kind of didactic finger-wagging way. I mean, there's, a, there's crochets made by Emily Moore with her mum, an amazing wall piece. There's um, Jade Montserrat searing text works, mm. talking about straightening hair, bleaching skin. There's a celebration of disco. There's Alberta Whittle's great piece that actually has a nice conversation with John O'Confra because it's about water and migration and self-help. So multiplicity of experience being shared here. And in that show you have this wonderful dialogue, not just in Alberta Whittle, but throughout the show. Not, not kind of taking it totally literally but just this this toing and froing with the comforts were and different generations of artists and liz johnson art her great big wonderful banner archive images of, of fantastic looking women looking so goddessy and powerful and then artists i didn't know at all solo olulode's beautiful romantic paintings of lovers under moonlight and lovers lying in fields so these different tempos and these different kind of paces and tones which of course runs with john O'Confer's work as well on a much more epic scale I also want to talk about Charles Gaines's show, major African-American conceptual artist, major contributor to that whole history. He's of on my hit list. I'm going to see him after this interview, actually. Oh, great. <laughs> well, it is, it is so wonderful. And, you know, what I love about Charles Gaines's work is that it's all about, you know, the objective system that he applies to the work. He's all about being against subjectivity, about the myth of the genius artist and following systems to make his work. And yet he creates this wonderfully beautiful work. That in, in this show, um, it's, it works from the Numbers and Faces series and, and the Numbers and Trees series series and in both works he uses these numbered systems to create cumulative works which build up to these wonderful colourful images and they completely belie this conceptual approach and I really urge everybody to see it, it's a wonderful show um, and down the road from that I actually visited um, Robert Mangold's uh, Pace show, this was one of the things that really struck me about how different it is to be looking at art all of a sudden, is I was looking at Robert Mangold's work and I was looking at the, these, these moments where paint seeps in from one field of colour into another and just becoming so sort of almost fetishistically loving towards it, you know, just loving the physicality of paint. It makes us really look afresh, even battle-scarred veterans like us, you know, I mean, and even with the Udo Rodinoni, I looked and saw his wonderful handprints and his footprints in the paint, and then there's a great show of Robert Rauschenberg, and not, and not Vital, at, at Tadeus Ropak, and Rauschenberg, these beautiful nightshades and phantoms they're called, and it's brushed aluminium and ink, and brushed aluminium and mirrored aluminium, and these beautiful shadowy 
shadowy spectral photographs he actually took himself, they're not found images, on these shiny ghostly backgrounds, all slightly filtered through one's Covid experience of sort of reality being just out of one's grasp and the not Vital portraits with these painterly auras around them. And I was really revelling in the paint strokes, you know, you, you get really excited about the physicality because we're at last encountering stuff face to face. I should add that when I saw the Robert Mangold show, one of the kind of utterly absurd elements to all of this is of course part of Burlington Gardens which is part of the Royal Academy complex but of course the Royal Academy is closed so we're here we are going to galleries they are so safe Covid wise I mean of course nowhere is 100% safe but they're so well managed there is so much social distance going on there's so much space and yet our museums have to wait another five weeks before don't I... get me started I can go to Primark or I can get a Manny Peddy now but I can't go to the British Museum or the Tate it's absolute lunacy but we could spend all day ranting about that indeed we can should we go and look at some art do let's so louisa here we are we're in gagosian grosvenor hill and we're looking at a radical move in a new direction for rachel whiteridge well, I mean, you know, she spent 30 years casting space and making space solid, and now she's done the complete reverse. She's made this extraordinary shed structure out of real pieces of stuff, bits of wood, bits of corrugated iron, lumps of tree, and it's like they've been, it's been through some kind of disaster. It's blown out. It's, it's dematerialising, and all these elements, which are the real thing, the real material stuff, not a cast, are all painted with layer upon layer of chalky paint. So it's sort of hysterical, but also res- strained at the same time. It's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, the key thing people have said, well, it looks more or less like some of her other work, and of course that's true, but the key thing is, of course, she spent her entire working life peeling back layers to reveal a solid thing, and here she's constructed a layer around a void, which is a massive transformation. Absolutely, making something that is constructing around a void, but it's still very immaterial, because there's gaps, there's holes, there's bits blown out, you can see right the way through, whereas it was sort of suffocated and coagulated when she was casting space. I mean, I remember 400 years ago in the early 90s going and taping, making a radio programme with, with a blub, 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 blub of the cement going in to solidify her house. And I feel now here's this wonderful, airy, blown apart, e- exhaling again house that's come full circle. And it's, it's a complete reversal. And she's made all this herself. You know, she actually put the stuff together. She, she said that when I saw her on Monday that some of these bits of stick and bits of stuff are actually from her garden, you so it's highly personal she's actually painted this herself she's made it herself and there's a feeling of sort of tenderness and a love of material a love of actually engaging with those little funny crumbly bits around the edge of the corrugated iron little bits of stick the details are fantastic in this they are indeed. I mean, one of the things about that, even though it's a departure, is, is absolutely consistent with the existing language in its sort of poetic power, isn't it? Because I mean, she's been making these shy sculptures, as she calls them, like a boating shed on a, on a lake in Scandinavia and sheds in the desert, which, you know, and, and she calls them shy sculptures because they don't impose on you. That you, could, you might discover them, but generally they're not sort of landmarks. They're not sort of right in the centre of London. But they relate to that, don't they? Oh, completely. I mean, she's still, you know, there's a love of the everyday, the everyday stuff that nobody looks at you know she casts spaces spaces under beds under chairs hot water bottles she beach combs avidly that wonderful show at Tate Britain a few years ago you saw she drew constantly she picks stuff up her studio is full of bits of stick and bits of stone and here in a way she's made this kind of wonderful composite it's a kind of collage of all the things that she loves she draws beautifully in a way this is a bit like drawing in space I'm looking at all these linear bits of trellis and bits of bits of stick and stone and all the kind of planks making these grids there's still a rigor here she hasn't gone completely free form there's still a rigor here but it's it's a free rigor there's a kind of extraordinary a, a catastrophic but also controlled if those are catastrophic we have these rather marvelously calm works around it don't we let's go and have a look at these they look like the bottoms of cardboard boxes but they're not quite that are they? well these are lining the walls again her love of minimal work they look like the bottoms of cardboard boxes but actually they're painted bronze casts of cardboard boxes painted in this gorgeous kind of pearly yellowy creamy paint I mean there's a real love of colour here and looking over on the other wall there's another piece of box that looks like it's been unfolded it's kind of you know regular old delivery box that's been unfolded cast in bronze and painted again with a kind of pinky purple pearly colour so there's, it's like she's playing. She's having fun with this stuff. Over on the other wall is another pink piece. It's actually a bog-standard notice board, pin board, with stuff on it, you can see, but encased in beautiful, pale, 
pink resin with a little blob on two places where the keyhole's been cast. So she's still casting, she's still solidifying, but in a more airy, more kind of expansive way. Let's go into the neighbouring gallery. So the major work in that first gallery is called Poltergeist, and now this one is called Doppelganger, and this feels another stage down the road of catastrophe to me. I don't know what... Yes, I mean, it's another shed form. It looks like some giant has stomped on it from on high. I mean, the whole roof is caved in, the corrugated iron is leaning in, the door's toppling out, the walls are leaning... I mean, it's got a kind of crazy Wizard of Oz sort of feel to it, you know, the shed just collapsing. I'm also thinking slightly of Cornelia Parker's sort of dematerialised, exposed shed. We could do a whole thesis on sheds in art, but this <laughs> This is, this is a really, it's a very uncanny, a very disturbing piece, I think. There's a sort of energy, but a crazy energy. There really is a sense of disaster here. And I think, you know, one can't help but look at it through the filter of working through lockdown, the pandemic, climate change, Black Lives Matter, atrocities taking place. I mean, I think, you know, we'd all have to be robots not to be responding to this. And I think, I'm not looking at it as white read specific comment but you can feel that this is really fed in in this kind of disaster stricken sculpture but everything is painted chalky white everything is meticulously arranged so again you've got this kind of nurturing painting arranging fabricating she makes all these herself so it's a sort of lovely tension between unbridled explosion and a very meticulous almost forensic eye for detail you talked about how Rachel's been playing, and one of the things that I really like about her latest work is that she's keeping that language of casting, as you say, in some works, but she's, she's started putting corrugated steel beneath some of these resin pieces. Let's go and have a look at one now. This is particularly beautiful, isn't it? It's these kind of triptych, these three slim, tall, rectangular panels, which is a cast of a window in resin with the corrugated iron behind it. So you've got this sort of lovely, subtle play of light in a gorgeous kind of grey-blue. I mean, it's quiet, it's lovely. It's like a winter's sunny day blue, almost. Like it's kind of slightly filtered light. And, and, and it's called Untitled Snow, this piece. And Rachel's so good at titles, right? I mean, you know, um, Untitled Snow, just giving you enough of a hint of a means of interpreting the work. And then, of course, this corrugated um, steel beneath it takes on the quality of, of um, drifts of snow. And it has a beautiful, slightly crumpled surface, so it looks delicate, almost like paper, but you're right, the light is exquisite. It's that kind of smothered light of, of, of snow. You can kind of feel the, the hushed sense of it. It's, a, it's all that Doppelganger, this explosive shed, isn't. It's the opposite. It's this quiet, contemplative, you know, very poetic, whereas you've got this sort of crazy, expansive piece going on behind you. I think the conversation between the two just shows what a great artist she is. Yeah, and, and, and you talked earlier on about how she makes stuff by herself. One thing about her work, and she's had drawing shows, but it's, it's probably a less well-understood element of her work, is that she's, she's very much a drafts person. She's always drawing. She's, you know, there, there's a room, in fact, we haven't focused on, but there's a room of drawings here. But there's these works which she calls night drawings, which I just think are so spectacular. Exquisite. I mean, let's not forget the one we've just been looking at. The snow has a very painterly feel, you know, the colours, the forms. I mean, she's a very rounded artist, but these are absolutely stunning. They're made from papier-mâché, and she, again, this is a sort of... definitely has an element of environmental concern about it. She's, you know, using recycled materials, and, and she's been doing that increasingly in recent years. But here, the papier-mâché is painted black, and then she's created these sort of dotted forms over the top, and, of course, what you see is constellations. You see constellations, but you also see spores, you could see viruses, you could see contamination. The cast, again, you can see the imprint of a grid of, of windows or of some kind of sense of underlying structure. I mean, she has, there's always a rigour there, but these are very, very evocative, aren't they? You're right, the constellations, but they're sort of slightly contaminating as well. Maybe I'm just reading it through a COVID filter, but there's, they're complex, they're rich, and they, as you say, they're recycling the, the material, but using it in a very sensuous and very kind of emotionally charged way. Now, you don't often think of Rachel's work as having a great deal of humour in it. Actually, she's a very funny person, she, and, and there, is, there is a su subtle strain of humour running through her work. So when you see a work that's called Untitled Crinkle Crankle, <laughs> it, you know, th th that's the, probably the most obvious example of that in the show, and it's a, it's a curious work, isn't it? It is, with a with shiny corrugated iron, again, underneath the, underneath the resin, and you've got, it's got a crinkly crankly... Um, surface. I mean, it is all crumpled, reflecting the light beautifully. It's quite exuberant, but 
restrained again because it's encased in, in the resin, these three panels. And in a way, Crinkle Crankle's looking at Doppelganger, which could say crunch. You know, you, you suddenly get all onomatopoeic on you. But no, I mean, I think that the work has a lightness, it has a humour, it has a seriousness. You know, it can still be funny and serious and important and full of gravitas, but also just not po-faced. There's not finger-wagging going on here, even though it talks about environment, it talks about the world that we've lived in for the last, last decade. I mean, White Reed has had an incredibly productive lockdown. I mean, look what's come out of it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, on a brush with the interview I did with her for, the, for our sister podcast, she talked about poetry, and she talked about this idea of two words touching. And I thought that was a very evocative statement almost about her own work actually she she has the ability to make major statements with very little and with just a lot of thought and a lot of care doesn't she absolutely yes and one thinks of you know 30 years of her work was solidifying space basically suddenly a light switch became epic and reversed i'm just looking here at the sort of poetic conversations between the, the, the little frilly edges of corrugated steel, the branches, the grids, the nature, the culture. It's almost like a kind of visual syntax taking place. And I think this thing about words touching is absolutely beautiful. And yes, the touching, the surfaces, you know, everything is considered here. This is not, this, this crazy piece, Doppelganger, may look like some kind of cataclysm has happened, but every minute bit of it is carefully considered like a poet would polish words and syntax. It's been so lovely to look at some art with you. Thank you, Ben. It's been a treat. Rachel White Reed's exhibition, Internal Objects, is at Gagosian in Grosvenor Hill until the 6th of June. To find the dates of the other exhibitions we mentioned, visit the gallery's websites and do remember you need to book your visit in advance. In a moment, I talk to the artists Idris Khan and James Welling. But first, here are some of the top stories on the Art Newspaper's website. This week marked the two-year anniversary of the fire that ripped through Notre Dame in Paris on the 15th of April 2019. In a report by Vincent Noss, the site's chief architect, Philippe Villeneuve, said that although the fire caused major damage to the cathedral, it could have been much worse. He added that despite delays caused by COVID-19, the Parisian landmark is on schedule to reopen by the target date of 2024, in time for the Olympic Games in the French capital. Re-emerging as a force in New York's Chelsea neighbourhood after a two-year, $20 million renovation, the Dear Art Foundation will reopen this Friday, writes Nancy Kenny. The foundation's new project unites its three buildings on West 22nd Street and underlines its gritty history of inventively revitalising existing structures. A 32,500 square foot project, which includes 20,000 square foot for exhibitions and other programming, the space will be used to champion under-recognised artists and to serve as an information hub for all 11 of Dia's long-term art sites. The first works on display are a film and two pairs of light sculptures commissioned from the artist Lucy Raven. A survey of people in the US museum sector has found that 43% have lost income as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, reports Nancy Kenny again. The American Alliance of Museums study, released this week, also said that the average decline in earnings for US museum workers amounts to 31%. Of the 2,666 respondents polled in March this year, nearly half of paid museum staff reported shouldering an increased workload due to COVID-19, with many saying that they experienced a serious impact on their mental health and well-being. You can read these stories and much more on theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iPhone and iPad, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This April, explore Christie's Classic Week, a hybrid series of seven live and online auctions that feature timeless textures and carefully crafted pieces from antiquity to the 20th century. Sales include old master paintings, European art and antiquities, books and manuscripts, and two single owner auctions, the Kagan Collection and the Elaine and Alexandra Rosenberg Collection of illuminated manuscripts and early printed books. Discover Botticelli's Madonna and Child and works by Corot and other Barbizon artists in the same conversation as A Dozen Book of Hours, Egyptian Glass, a 1776 broadside of the Declaration of Independence and a newly discovered Samuel Band of 12 issues of Benjamin Franklin's Paul Richard's Almanac. Viewing begins on the 17th of April by appointment only at Christie's Galleries at Rockefeller Centre in New York. Find out more at christies.com. 
Welcome back. Now, one of the exhibitions to open in London this week is Idris Khan's The Season's Turn at Victoria Miro Gallery, an exhibition of two distinct installations, both featuring work made in the past year. It includes a suite of 28 works using watercolour, oil and collage that include fragments of the score of Ivaldi's Four Seasons. It also includes a sequence of huge blue paintings in which rectangular forms are layered with texts written by the artist in the pandemic period. I went to the gallery to talk to Idris. Idris, one wouldn't quite call this work bucolic, but it's informed by non-urban space, right? It is, it is, yeah. Um, I wanted to create a show about all the colours that I was sort of witnessing over the last over the last year, um, where I sort of left London very early on, just before the first lockdown, and uh, headed out to the English countryside and never really lived in a countryside before, so um, I found myself perhaps looking more intensely at uh, all the colours that started to pop up around me. Did the idea of following a seasonal progression come to you very early, or was it something that happened as you were just in the studio trying to find means of making work in these new circumstances? I think I was frozen, actually, when the first lockdown happened. Um, I didn't really make any work, got two kids, all a bit of craziness going on, you know. And I guess it was just like sort of, it came to me probably around two or three months after being there. It's like slowing down and... I remember very vividly, um, you know, got there and it was sort of just coming out of winter into spring and um, Blossom was just coming out. And it's quite nice now you're in the gallery because you sort of see the progression or the linear progression now where the first image that you see is a, a pink painting um, and then actually as, as you look around, it's, 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 it's the natural progression going into summer and then going into autumn and then going into winter. So um, that's the kind of way I want the viewer to, you know, experience the work. And so were they literally made chronologically as well? They were made, no, very much made as a, as a body of work uh, at the same time. I suppose that was the, that, that was the hardest point about this, was this, to create these colours. And, and I didn't want it to sort of be you know, straight out of a pot, so to speak. So all the colours were very you know, were mixed individually. And, and I often think, I wasn't referencing anything in particular in some way. I, I, I sort of think back now, and it was more about a memory of a colour, rather than, say, being having the thing in front of you and trying a reference from it. You know, the daffodils or bluebells or, I don't know, sort of... Uh, I always think of this as sort of <laughs> wild garlic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely deep green, really beautiful deep green, yeah. It is, and then obviously the blues and, and the skies that change um, throughout the year as well. It was just more of like, like you were just positioning yourself in spring, what would those colours be in your mind? Um, hopefully when the viewer comes in they gravitate to a certain colour that uh, perhaps reminds them of that season. Can you tell us about the, how the images are made up because there are multiple elements so to tell us about those different stages if you like of the image. It's quite nice we walk closely to, to see some of the detail. The process is, is it's an aluminium panel um, and then a mounted uh, paper interface on top of watercolour paper and then that allows me to put the watercolour wash on, on the background so my choice of colour that goes onto the, goes onto the surface. And then um, the musical notes are oil, um, and um, I, make, uh, I make rubber stamps uh, in the studio. I've got about over 150,000 stamps now. I was going to say, you must have accumulated so many so over many. the years. I'm, I'm actually really hoping to show them all at Freeze this year, if, if that happens. And they're, they're, it's beautiful things because they become like relics of a painting, which is really nice. I mean, often people think about what's written or what's, you know, I hear you know, musical notes, why, what musical notes are they? You know, for me, then they, they become like little relics in themselves. You know, I'm not going to make a book of them. They almost feel like physical objects, which is really nice. And then in the centre of the piece, I have the collage element. So that's the actual uh, sheet music of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And it's really lovely in the studio because I've got them all over, all over the floor, like literally books and books and books of just painting this, this, this sheet music with different colours. And then finally I start to compose, and it's kind, of, it's kind of nice because I almost do feel like a little bit of a composer when I'm bringing all these elements together and piecing them together and cutting them in certain ways. And, and I think what's quite nice when you look at the work is that I didn't want the collage element to be completely flat. I wanted it to have a bit of movement, a bit of energy. Um, and then what's nice is that the actual cut line between the two sheets of paper becomes quite important because of that shadow. And, it, and as you look around the room, you know, they sort of create their own rhythm um, you know, within each work. And, and what's quite lovely as well is, is leaving this band of pure colour at the bottom. So if you can imagine stamping you know, almost three quarters of the whole piece 
and then leaving this this band of colour. So that's what continues around the room that also, that also changes, and that's kind of nice to keep that freshness of just the colour itself. Yeah, it's sort of an it, it's almost like the air in the piece, and you kind of need that, don't you? When you've got so much density, there needs to be some air in it, and it, it, it's really it's a, it's, there is a sort of lovely lovely feeling of of a kind of spatial organisation going on here. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I thought that when I hung the show, it would feel quite calm, but it doesn't actually. It feels quite chaotic, I think. And maybe that is something, maybe something in the nuances as well uh, in each piece that there's there's a lot of energy, and then it's almost like the frame contains that energy as well, which is a nice balance. Is it significant that in in terms of these the papers you've got some in which the sheet music is on its side? What tell us about that? I, it's just that's just the, the playful element of it. But I, again, it's maybe a nod to abstract expressionism in some way. I mean, like I think about this. A, we're sort of looking at a blue one now, and, and it's, it's lovely how the watercolour acts on the, the sheet music because obviously the sheet music's not there to be watercoloured in the first place. So it absorbs it very differently, and you never know what you're going to get. It's completely different each time um, when you apply the watercolour. So then it leaves these kind of strange, wonderful bleed marks um, um, on the paper. And, you know, that one where it's on its side almost feels a little bit like a Barnett Newman, like a line through a Barnett Newman. I was going to say there's zips, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. really do feel like that. And I think I was probably conscious of that when I was making them. It's like, you know, it's quite nice to have a nod to, to the past in some way. And I think it's just playful. It's just what works on the page, you know. And, um, and then using, diff- like, you know, sometimes I'd use two sheets, sometimes I'd use three. Um, it's just whatever the balance works with the background. And it's quite lovely how some of the collage elements almost feel like they're sort of falling into the paintings and some of them sit quite um, abruptly on on top but um... yeah yeah i was wondering if in terms of your text pieces one of the key things about them is again that density of the text means makes them unreadable and likewise with the music here right so if you sat down at a piano with 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 these works of art in front of you it, you, you couldn't interpret the music well i suppose that's it's harder for the music actually to can be completely eradicated um you know with words you sort of go on and on and i suppose the the patination um it gets more unreadable and unreadable whereas the music seems to sort of sit in front of it a little bit it's very hard to eat, to keep going i don't think I, it'll be too heavy if you like so there's a lighter feeling to these um and uh and maybe maybe a more of a heavy presence with the with the word paintings and can you talk more generally about about the way that you've used music? Do you use music because it has that kind of abstract resonance, or is there a, is, is there is there another quality that you're seeking from music to kind of imbue into visual art? There's a lovely quote from Agnes Martin where she said um, that music is one of the highest forms of abstraction. I suppose that's always been kind of conscious in my mind when when using it. It's also um, a historical reference for me because my mother was a very, very good pianist. So I grew up around music in the house. And that was kind of a vivid memory of, of, of her as well. She unfortunately passed away when she was 59, so very young. But I have a memory of all sheet music being all over the floor. And I guess it's kind of a nice link to that. And I, I guess maybe that's why it keeps repeating in, in, in my work. But I think so. And I think it's, you know, obviously if you can't read music, it just has another abstract element, right? So you, you come to it and you, you don't know what notes they're, they're making or what sounds they're making. So it's kind of like, it's just another form of abstract language for me. Yeah. You talked about Barnett Newman. There are obvious Rothko elements in there, but I'm really pleased you talked about Agnes Martin because I know you love Agnes Martin's work. And, I, and, I, and it's, it seems to me that she's, she's this sort of consistent presence in your work. In terms of that, one thing about Agnes Martin that I always find really difficult is when somebody doesn't know her work, trying to explain why it's so wonderful because you, you tie yourself in knots trying to evoke it, right? Yeah. It, and, and I wonder if, if when you're making work and Agnes is in your mind, whether you can get closer to... to to knowing what it is about those works that is so special? I think, you know, I love her writings the, the most. You know, her book of writings are, um, are unbelievable, and I've used them in some other paintings that I've made in the past. And I also went on an amazing pilgrimage uh, to, um, to Taos to, to see her studio, um, an amazing trip through New Mexico to sort of visualise what she was seeing, really, while, while making those paintings. Of, you know, I see them as beauty. And I think that, yeah, there is this, I suppose, this sort of, the constant lines, the overlay of lines, trying to create perfection, perhaps, within a, within a work. I mean, maybe more in the blue paintings upstairs rather than here. But, you know, the act of repetition, the act of, I suppose, cathartic repetition as well within, within the work, perhaps, is there. 
Um, but I agree with you, yeah, a lot of people probably have a very difficult <laughs> relationship with those very, very stripped back paintings. But, you know, I just see them as complete dedication to, to, to one thing, you know. Yeah. I also think, of course, and you mentioned it in the very sort of impetus for this piece, that, you know, you're also occupying another tradition here, which is the English landscape tradition. And, you know, arguably the most consistent tradition in, in English British painting. And, and, and how much you consciously are sort of riffing on that tradition or, or whether it, it feels like straying into a slightly strange territory. It does feel like a strange territory, although actually I was quite, um, I was quite surprised that actually Petworth was actually a, a home of a lot of Turner paintings, and I know he spent a lot of time there, so you, know, you can look at the fact that um, he was there making these at the time, uh, you know, beautiful landscape paintings as well. But um, I suppose it's, it's not something consciously that I think about when, when, I, when I made these. Um, but now, you know, this, I mean, in the gallery they're hung in a line, but actually as a grid um, of four sevens, they look quite amazing too. And actually, when you do that, you're sort of, you, know, you have to stand back quite far from it and sort of and see it as this um, almost massive landscape painting, which, you know, as a progression, I'm quite excited about. You mentioned the blue paintings upstairs, so let's go and have a look at them. Right. So if the works downstairs are a response, in a way, to the sort of external world, this is very much about the internal world, right? It is, it is. So we're standing in a room um, with, well, how many paintings have we got? We've got eight paintings. Um, they're, some are really, really large scale, two metres by 230, and then two sort of smaller works. But yeah, this, they are. They're very much about my, my internal thoughts. Um, I suppose the start of the process is me writing a, a sort of passage of writing or a poem or a slight diary. So these were, these were words that I made over the last year about what we were going through. Um, and, and then they're, they're stamped onto the surface of this big blue gesso ground on an aluminium panel. And you know, different to the music works downstairs, the words are much more eradicated. And as I stamp... The process is quite a lovely one because obviously when you write something, um, it's immediate and you can read it. Um, when I stamp and overlay the words, they become, um, they just start to disappear. And, you know, often people say, well, what's written there? But in the end, it doesn't really matter what's written there. Well, I think what's, what, what matters is what you bring to it. You know, you can see a sort of the end of the sentence or the start of the sentence. And then you can make your mind up where that sentence goes. So in a way, they sort of feel like hovering shapes or bars, and quite maybe musical as well. Yeah, indeed, yeah. I wondered about how much that writing process is almost like that surrealist tradition of automatic writing, a kind of stream of consciousness, getting stuff down, and how much of it is organised, sort, as in, you know, almost like poetry. It's not, actually, it's not very organised at all. I mean, I, if someone came to me and said, I want to print these, I'd be, no way, you can never have a look of these, um, because they probably don't make that much sense. It is like that. It's almost like a flurry of, of, of words. And, um, and it's like, well, I, but I kind of know when that passage is finished. I don't think it makes much sense, but it's just these sort of words and, and almost patterns, if you like. And then that process of stamping, again, in that cathartic way, that you're almost releasing something. When I started making the stamp paintings, it was sort of around... 2010 you know I mentioned my mother downstairs that was the year that we, that we lost her and also my wife and I had well she had a, a still a stillbirth baby so it was a really traumatic year for us and I needed a way of making paintings uh, and and I came into the studio and I would write all the feelings down writing this grief um, almost away if you like and then I said well why can't I make them into stamps and sort of stamp away these bad feelings and thoughts I was having so that's the first time I sort of stepped into making these paintings. Tell us about the colour blue, because I wonder how much the colour blue is connected to that. You, you've spoken about it as a very spiritual colour on the one hand, a, a colour that people seem to immediately connect to emotional states. Is that significant in this sense? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, the blue pigment itself is 50% ultramarine blue and 50% Prussian blue. And I quite like that it's in between, it's almost between thinking about sort of a... a night a dark night blue and also a very light daytime blue and you're sort of in that middle state if you like so when 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 a viewer comes to them i think hopefully they they do bring their own emotional state to the work you know maybe they come and they're in a in a good mood and perhaps it feels light and maybe if you come with the slightly darker you maybe it takes you somewhere else can you say something about the, about weight 
and these works because it seems to me that what you have is these fields of the text which, which read when you're far, far enough away as essentially rectangles and squares. And one of the things that I'm really conscious about looking at them is that they have very different weights, they have very different moods according to the, to the size of these lozenges. So tell me, what, tell me about that and, and about you know, how, how much of a kind of trial and error process is that? How do you come up with the compositional characteristics of each of the work? They do feel like that. They do feel very sort of heavy, and, and I think I hope people look at them and think that they are very time-consuming, because because they are. They're a very big physical effort, and especially the big ones, um, you know, less so perhaps with the smaller ones. But the way I sort of compose them is also looking at sheet music. So if you imagine looking at a page of music and then you block out the bars on them, um, I really like doing that. And then what's left are the spaces between the bars, and then in these paintings, I wanted to create a sort of rhythm throughout the room, so the lines shift, so they break into two or three or four bars. And actually, that's quite nice as an installation because it almost sort of it takes your eye around the room and almost feels like perhaps the, the, the I don't know, the, the constant shifting line, almost like breathing. And, um, and then, of course, you think about these big, dense blocks as, as having almost like volume, you know, and then they get broken. You know, so if you think about it, Essentially, they're just, they would be one big rectangle, but I've made a cut line in that, and that cut line just sh- you know, sh- shifts around the room, which is quite nice. Of course, one thinks about Rothko, and that's obviously a very conscious statement. But, of course, you're, one of the things about Rothko is that he creates these solid masses of, of colour, um, which sort of bleed at the edges a bit. But fundamentally, they are, they are these sort of dominant forms, whereas, of course, yours, yours, by very nature of being composed through text, are utterly porous to a certain degree. So you're playing on that solidity and lightness again, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I am. And I think, that, I think that if you think about a Rothko painting, I, I, I actually think about anger or tension or aggression um, on a canvas. Physicality, the way he painted, struck his arms, and they were all done at, maybe some of them were done at, at speed. And, and uh, for these, take around two and a half months to make. And Each one? Yeah. And, wow. and the, the, you know, the, the background takes a hell of a long time to, to create the, the, the blue gesso, and then obviously, then the stamping, which is kind of, I keep coming back to them and, and seeing when the patination stops and finishes, you create this beautiful rhythm within them. Um, and they're much more delicate than a Rothko in some way, I think. Um, yeah, that's what I think. I think, you know, you think about paint and the different colours of paint and how he was a master at mixing paint. Um, for me, this sort of simplicity of the two, just the two blues um, together is a slightly different a- approach, I think, and it also has a very meditative quality, which is probably going back to sort of the Agnes Martin, getting that fine balance between background and and surface. They are deeply meditative. I'm conscious that here I am in this place. And, it's, it, you know, it has that feel, undoubtedly, of, a, of a, almost like a chapel, right? And, 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 you know, it does have that, that sort of transportive element to it. It does. And, you know, the galleries always called this room the upper room. And it's sort of always... And, and this ceiling, you know, with this amazing wooden beams across the space and the light that it... Uh, the light that it uh, transmits through the skylights is, is very beautiful. It almost creates these lines on the wall as well, and they almost look like they're running through the paintings. So I was obviously very conscious of the fact that this, is, this was my room and that feeling of calmness. It's, it's very different, as I said, to downstairs, because the downstairs has a slight chaotic feeling with all the colours changing, especially what we've been through over the last year as well, and you know, not knowing where you are, where, where you were. Or, and, and up here, you sort of feel much calmer in, in, in that kind of state of spirituality, perhaps. Well, Idris, thank you so much for telling us about these extraordinary works. I appreciate that. Thank you, Beth. Idris Khan's The Season's Turn is at Victoria Miro Gallery in Wharf Road, London, until the 15th of May. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The artist James Welling has been making photographs using images of ancient Greek and Roman objects and buildings over recent years, and he's chosen to talk about Kore 674, a female statue made around 500 BCE and found on the Acropolis in Athens in the 19th century. It's now in the Acropolis Museum, and you can see an image of the object and Welling's responses to it if you go to our website, click on the podcast tab, and look for this episode. 
James, you've chosen one of the Corée from the Acropolis uh, to discuss. So to tell us why you've chosen this particular object. Well, I have been photographing Greek and Roman antiquities since uh, 2018. I had been photographing dance and working with a lot of dance imagery. And sort of perversely, I realized that if I, I've worked with sculptures, I wouldn't have to chase dancers after model releases, and it would be a lot easier Um, photographically. So I went to the Metropolitan Museum and just started looking at all kinds of figurative sculpture, Uh, Egyptian, uh, 19th century, and I ended up in the Greek and Roman rooms. When I was there, I photographed a number of sculptures and portraits, and I was particularly struck by a second century AD woman named Julia Mamea's portrait. It was severely damaged. Half of her face had been hacked off which was not you know, uncommon with um, emperors who were deposed. Her son had been an emperor and she was his chief advisor and they were um, murdered in, uh, outside of, um, I think, Munich, Germany in the you know, 240 AD. Anyway, so Julia's face was very damaged, but in the photograph I took of her, it came alive. And I printed it over 240 times each print with this sort of handmade emulsion that I'd created seemed to express uh, a different facet of her personality or her intelligence. So that got me extremely interested in figurative sculpture and in uh, faces from antiquity. I photographed a lot of other things, and um, many of those works, landscape, sculptures, objects, are going to be in a show at the Grand Hornu in Belgium. But about six months ago, Um, I started reading up on this group of sculptures called the Athenian Cori, sculptures that were actually excavated in the 19th century from their tomb that the Greeks had had created for them in about 400 and something BC, when they expanded the, the space of the Acropolis by filling in low spots. These sculptures had fallen out of favor, and they, they served as landfill, so they were actually very well preserved. You know, I'd, I'd heard about these archaic sculptures from Charlie Ray. He had talked about this famous Koros at the Metropolitan Museum. And I'd heard Charlie talk a lot about the Koros, which is a similar time to the Korai, the female sculptures. But the Koros are very Egyptian-looking, nude men striding forward. And when I started looking at their female equivalents, I was absolutely astonished because they're wearing Izzy Miyake outfits, just <laughs> incredible crinkle uh, pleats, and just the, the garments are absolutely stunning. So I, I actually came in on the uh, what they were wearing, first of all, and I've subsequently I've learned that these sculptures are, of course, famous for history of uh, fashion design. All, all fashion designers know about them. But I think as artists, we know about the male body uh, sort of prioritized in a way that uh, these incredible uh, garments that they're wearing uh, don't make an impact in art history the way that the men do. And then I started looking at their hair, absolutely amazing cornrows and tresses and pigtails and all kinds of incredible hairstyles. This is after I'd taken most of the photographs that I would eventually work with for this show in Belgium. So I began to look through my photographs that I'd taken in in Athens at the uh, Archaeological Museum and in Oxford and at the Louvre. I went to the Ashmolean Museum in early 2000. And it turned out that I'd been photographing these cori, but had not really looked at them. Ah, how amazing. You know, I, I knew that I should be covering my bases, so I was taking lots of, lots of photographs when I go to different museums, not knowing exactly what will surface. So at a certain point, I was just, I became stunned by these, these sculptures and then started reading about them. And it turned out that at the National Museum, at the Acropolis Museum in Athens, the, these figures, the male and female sculptures, are, are off limits for photography. You know, there'd be a riot if uh, people were allowed to photograph these 20 or 30 uh, female figures along with their male counterparts. Uh, So you have all of these tourists 
have to put their cell phones away when they go into the rooms with the Cori. And I realized that's one of the reasons that I didn't pay much attention to them when I was in Athens, because I was actually only interested in things I could photograph, which seems kind of stupid. <laughs> then I looked through the pictures I'd taken at the Ashmolean Museum, and sure enough, there were plaster casts of the Cori that I just dutifully photographed. And I began to look at them, and they, they were not the actually the uh, they're hard to photograph, they weren't well lit, they're, they show all kinds of seams and uh, you know evidence of the casting process. But I began to focus in on this one particular sculpture, which I subsequently learned was Cora 674. She's on the cover of books. She's like probably the second most famous uh, Cora sculpture after the famous Peplos Cora. So I don't know how I came up with the idea, but after looking at them for a few months and trying to print these pictures of the plaster casts, I realized that I could go to some of the books that I'd been studying about the sculptures and actually scan a photograph and work with my plaster casts and cobble together some sort of hybrid image. So I became interested in this sculpture partly because I wanted to make a work with her, but it also caused me to look a lot more closely at the sculpture, at her expression. It's damaged. Her eyes are sort of smashed and her, her face is also disfigured. But certain views, she she actually comes alive in a way that I was not aware that a, a sculpture from antiquity could actually uh, come alive. I think that the thing that really allowed me to see into this woman's face was putting eyes in her uh, in the eye sockets, which were always painted, or sometimes they had precious uh, gems set in as the eyes. Actually, I grabbed some eyes from a Manet painting and stuck those in the sculpture, and it just absolutely leapt out at me. So which Manet painting's eyes did you borrow? Well, it's a kind of uh, comment on the world we live in. You know, I've subscribed to the Instagram feeds of a number of museums, and, you know, on Manet's birthday, which was, you could check it, it probably was February. You know, every, everyone's like putting up a picture of their favorite Manet, every museum. So the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston had a Manet painting of a, a young woman with greenish eyes. And, uh, you know, it's pretty low res. I grabbed it on my cell phone and then um, sent it over to my computer. And the eyes, when I inserted them into this sculpture... I tried human eyes, too. I tried, uh, you know, eyes that I found on the Internet. But it was Manet's eyes that really uh, animated her, uh, turned her into a, li a living person. And, uh, of course, you know, in reading about these sculptures, it's unclear exactly who these women are, but they are definitely not deities, quote. They're living uh, models, most probably. So it was a strange way to work backwards after... First of all, not looking at the sculptures, then secondly, seeing them as casts, and finally realizing that the only way to make this sculpture alive for me was to animate her with a corneal transplant. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I then I turned her hair red, so she has very, very bright red hair, and did some makeup work. I mean, I'm not very good with lipstick, but I put lipstick on her and some eyeshadow. So it's a kind of hybrid artwork where this sculpture comes alive uh, with the, you know, the pigment that was probably on her at, at one point. I mean, I'm sure different, but much more vital. But this is really fascinating, this aspect, because, of course, they were coloured, as you say, that, you know, they, they, they were coloured originally. We've, we've separated them from that actual history. They're so enshrined in the memory through art history, through uh, misguided um, classicists of the past as white objects with, with no coloration. And of course, you're, to, a, to an extent, you're revivifying that history. You're, you're returning them closer to the way that they would have appeared in their own time. But also you're deliberately creating colour that isn't authentic and that is very much of today, right? Right. But the interesting thing about the, the colour issue around classical sculpture, it was known when these were unearthed in the 19th century that they were colored. And recently there's, there have been a few exhibitions where this, this sculpture, other sculptures from the same period have been recolorized, you know, made casts and painted. And when you look at them, 
you go, oh, gee, they look terrible, <laughs> oh, pretty garish. But I think it's a, it's it's, and I don't want to rank on the the restorers who who put the color on, but in antiquity, this there was the sculptor and then there was the colorist, and a lot of the colorists were extremely well thought of. Putting the color on the sculpture it seems like what we do today. It's just like a demonstration. This is what they might have looked like. Well, you know. I, I don't want to know what they might have looked like. I want to know what what they look like, or I want to know see them in a way that is convincing. Of course, everyone's notions of what's realistic or naturalistic uh, vary, and I'm sure that perhaps some of the the work that the modern restorers have done is close to the original. But it never convinced me. They just look like, you know, just hideous. <laughs> I do. So tell me about your use of color, because of course historically, if you if you look back over your work, you're you're well known for the way that you've used color. How have you used color in connection with these classical sculptures? You know, when I started thinking about color in the early two thousands, it was right when working digitally emerged as a possibility, because if you're a photographer and you work with analog color, it's pretty restrictive. There's not much you can do, uh, at least the level that most people would work with a color photograph. There were, in media, there are ways of using bleach and dye to change colors, uh, which would have been available to people working in magazines. But most straight color photographers are kind of stuck with the rather limited controls of analog color printing. When digital came along, it offered, you know, to me and everyone else, a new control of color. So I began to really think a lot about what you could do with it I worked on, worked with colored filters and then worked with a kind of in a psychedelic uh, universe with my re most recent project called Choreograph, really looking back to practitioners in the 60s and 70s who were really not interested in naturalistic color. They were interested in psychedelia. And that led me to thinking about how, you know, we, we make color prints, inkjet or offset. And for the show that will be at the Grand Hornu in Belgium, this project called Cento, which is a Roman word for a collage poem, and the Cori will be in that uh, show. I sort of invented my own photographic process using lithography and oil painting and laser prints to kind of make this handmade color photograph. So a lot of the pictures, the Cori and the other work in the show are, are made with oil paint and a laser print. And some of them look very conventional. I mean, most of them look sort of naturalistic, but the Cori have bright red hair and uh, other sorts of uh, uh, colors that I, I introduced. But my interest in color is really around the question of, you know, the processes. In this particular body of work, I'm really interested in making the work look as if it was printed in the 1930s in a gravure, beautiful gravure book. So it really has a, a printed, like a printed in a book feeling. One of the things that that really interested me when you were talking about the Julia Mamea photographs was that the way when you applied the color and you applied these different techniques to it, each time the image reappeared to you, it was as if you were looking at a different person, mm. a different object. Is that happening too with the Cori? Uh Not as much. The Julia Mamea project involved a handmade. Uh, image in gelatin that I would coat with dye. And there were so many things that went wrong in the process that I was fortunate even to get a picture. And when I did, all of the mistakes and the drips and the errors of process only added to the uh, expressivity. But with the Cori, I'm using a much more controlled process, uh, a laser print <clears throat> as the base. And then I put by hand, I add color to it that sticks to the laser print the way ink sticks to a lithographic plate. Each print is sort of different with different buildup of paint and sometimes more expressive uh, gestures that I employ. Yeah, so the prints are more close to each other. They're in editions of five. So I'll print a couple and then choose the best one for the show. Well, James, thank you so much for telling us about your interest in this extraordinary sculpture and the work that's resulting. Well, thanks for the opportunity. 
James Welling's exhibition Cento is at the Grand Ornu Museum of Contemporary Art in Ornu, Belgium, from the 23rd of May to the 29th of August. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page, and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already done so, and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio, and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack, and David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Louisa, Idris and James, and thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.